Hello, welcome, thank you all very much for coming. Welcome to the Inside Out Lectures, a prestigious international visiting speaker series whose mission is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across the School of Art, Architecture and Design at Leeds Beckett University. To this end, we have flown in renowned speakers from France, Australia, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada and the USA. In order to enhance the cultural life of Leeds, we make the lecture series open to the general public and available to an international audience online via the LARP website. Here's the web link, www.leedsbeckett.ac.uk forward slash LARC, L-A-R-C. Today, our honoured guest comes closer from home. Yorkshire born and raised, Matty Bovan has, according to the Guardian national newspaper, ditched London, New York and Paris to start his own studio in Old York. They refer to Bovan as fashion's great bright hope, which is supported by his nomination at the British Fashion Awards for British Emerging Talent Women's Wear 2017. Taking a more ecologically sound approach to materials, Bovan says, there seems to be a consensus among people my age who are trying to find a way to operate in fashion that isn't mass production. That in my gut just feels right. More than ever, we need less stuff. Mass consumption, mass production can't go on forever. I like to be involved in everything. I really like every element to be touched by my hand. Craft is more important than ever. Imagine if you could print your own jumper at home. I think that will happen. But you have to have the handmade element along with the, with the, with the, with the tech element. Otherwise, fashion and consumption will spiral out of control. We have too much of everything on every level. Bovan, who is taught to knit by his grandma, aged 11, explores the relationship between handcrafted and machine made and sees the area of interest in design in the push and pull of oppositional ideas. He always starts his work with a lot of research and keeps himself fresh by working on at least five different things at once. He loves using materials that other designers would describe as gross, such as velour or air techs, and making these taboo fabrics desirable. Taking valuable time out from his preparations for his next collection, we are delighted to host this emerging talent. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Matty Bovan. Thank you so much. Okay, so, hi everyone, thank you for coming today. Can you all hear me? Yeah, kind of, okay, good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk you through kind of my process in fashion and industry up till kind of like now. Um, and like the previous collections I've done, I think I've done four now independently. So I'm gonna show you the clips of that. And I have some garments at the front, which I, you guys can come and look at at the end if you like. It's like a selection from like two or three collections, which is nice for you to all see, because obviously it's all very flat on the screens. So yeah, thank you for coming. And so let me know, think of questions for the end as well, because we're gonna do like a QA. and a I'm just gonna set my timer. So, um, I studied my BA in fashion knitwear at St. Martin's in London for four years. And before that, I did a year-long foundation in Leeds at the College of Art and Design, which is around the corner. And I did specialise in fashion. So I did, uh, yeah, like a four-year BA, which is like three years studying and a year in industry. And I did three placements, um, like one at Diane von Furstenberg in New York, one at Galliano in Paris, when he wasn't there. <laughs> and one at Louise Gray in London. So um, I was very lucky to be able to do that. And I think a lot of BAs now do do this like sandwich, sandwich year thing, which is a very good idea. I don't know how many of you are studying currently, but so I'm gonna show you some images from my final BA collection, which is kind of like my first kind of stand into like fashion. This is like my first, I guess, catwalk show technically. So and, yeah, you can see it all fine up there. So we have like, obviously my main interest is knitwear, but all these pieces here were, um, all the beaded stuff is plastic, like hair beads from like the cheap hair shops. And each bead was sewn together, like one by one, which I think is quite mad looking back at it. But um, I think I was on some sort of weird hellbent mission to kind of do as much work as possible, which I don't know why. But um, so you can kind of see this is like similar to my aesthetic even now. And all the digital, this is all like digital knitting. I don't know if you can, does the mouse work yet? which is all done through computerized machines, which is, again is why I talk about kind of like technology and the way it influences like 
textiles and like handcraft. So they did have one of these machines at St. Martin's in London, but they only have one because they're about £250,000 to buy. <laughs> um, so I did some pieces on that. So you can kind of see, like, this is like a very like, early version of my aesthetic. I don't know if that many people have seen this collection. So I'm just going to kind of show you through it. So, and all these, all these textiles in the middle, does the mouse work? Yeah. This was all hand-knitted, like, jelly kind of scoobies, I think you guys might call them, plastic-like cords. And then it was all melted under a huge heat press. So obviously you can tell my, like, passion for textiles has been going on for years, I mean, even before this, but um, yeah, so it was very uh, textile heavy, and the, it was a quite a specific thing to study knitwear, but it's quite a free course, and I think it's actually even got a lot more like open now, even these days, like a lot of students I talk to are kind of going across different areas, like multi multidisciplinary like areas, like print and knit and textiles, into fashion, which I think is great, I mean, something obviously I'm a huge fan of. So yeah, so this was every, it was incredibly heavy. I mean, at St. Martin's especially, I think a lot of courses, so it, the wearability factor wasn't really a considered thing, which I think is quite good when you're at that level because you don't have to consider like commercial aspects. Obviously you'll see as you, you go through the collections, uh, up until recently even, I, there's kind of more commercial ways of wearing stuff and thinking about stuff, but this is like a very pure like essence of very like almost unwearability, which I think at these art colleges is something you kind of should push because there's a lot of people that can do like t-shirts and stuff. So I then did, so I basically finished my BA straight away and then started the MA I think three months afterwards. Now I was very lucky I got two scholarships. Um, they do offer a lot of scholarships in, on that particular course and I think more and more BAs are offering scholarships now which is really important because I couldn't have studied on this course without this. So because obviously you don't get any funding for an MA. So um, the MA at Smart, I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Um, I was taught by a woman called Louise Wilson, who was like infamous, famous, shall we say, for being a bit of a tyrant. And I had her for a year. And um, I can't <laughs> probably even tell you the stories because it's all being recorded. Um, <laughs> but she was <laughs> very physical. <laughs> And very, very funny, but um, very, very hard and very intense, very different from a BA. Um, she would push you <laughs> until, yeah, until you had, you know, till she got the best out of you. It was very, really interesting. I knew the score going into it, but I was still quite shocked <laughs> at how um, intense it was. She sadly died when I was on, we were on the course at the end of my first year. And then we had, I think, we were, had about nine months left. So we had Fabio Piras, who took it over, who's amazing, who was already teaching on there and was my teacher. So um, I was very lucky. But it was, I guess, a very unusual time to be studying because that doesn't often happen, especially when it's someone that legendary in the industry. Um, but she did very much push for students getting funding and scholarships, which I think has carried on through the course. I mean, I'm sure it's the same in Leeds and stuff. You know, you, you need the... You need the money, you need the bursaries, you need the scholarships. I think it's important. But yeah, so anyway, going back to my, technically, my collection. So this was four years ago, I think, five years ago, maybe. And it's kind of very, it has like, I guess, strains of my BA in it, but it's very much this kind of <coughs> organic shape pushed very much to a 3D element. I was super happy with it. It kind of feels like bizarre looking back at it, really. Um, but again, you can see there's all different textures. I mean, a lot of it's, like some of it's domestic machine knitting, some of it's velour, my favorite. Some of it's hand knit, kind of plastic. Very experimental. It was in, very much inspired by all these kind of th 3D kind of sculptures and making stuff together with like jewelry becoming part of it. So these are all meant to be like brooches and they kind of were. Um, so it's this idea of kind of pinning all this kind of stuff together, but it was all obviously all constructed together. Um, and I think I don't think we had that long to make it. I don't remember having that long, much time on it, but it was an amazing experience. The MA is just very different at St. Martin's for like teaching you to kind of consider everything and uh, explore like every kind of level, like even if it's like doing your portfolio, like 2D work, if it like the relationship of the 3D work and the 2D work, um, very much a baptism of fire, studying under Louise anyway, <laughs> which was good. Um, so yeah, you can see, like we, Simon mentioned, uh, my love of tacky fabrics, as some people describe it. 
Um, this is actually three looks, all with velour in it. So I, f since I can remember, I've always gone to like the markets and the cheap fabric shops, always, and still do, because it's a lot less precious when you have to do that. I, I don't agree when certain schools and people con you know, encourage spending hundreds and hundreds, thousands of pounds on fabrics. I don't think it's necessary. I think for certain people, maybe they want to have like one piece made out of us, just consider it enough. But I mean, I love, I always say to my students, you know, go, go and start with the cheap stuff because you're lo a lot less precious about it. And also you surprise yourself at what you can do with it when you're not con too controlled. But maybe that's just my taste. So um, you can see uh, um, it was, everything was done with plastic boning all sewn into the side and then like overlocked into it. So I don't know how I didn't break everything doing that because it was all put through the industrial machines. But it was super fun. I'm afraid I don't have a video of it. I can't find it anywhere. I don't think that it was even digitalized when I was studying. I think we just got given a DVD. So sadly, I can't show you. It was great when it walked because it kind of bounced. I did find some really weird old fitting video on my computer. But um, yeah, so this was, it was super fun to make. Just feels really bizarre looking back at it. And yeah, and this, this became very like rock-like towards the end. A lot of people thought it was inspired by the sea, which I never actually really understood. But looking back, I can see why. <laughs> it's very like net. So all this is like, all this is like hand crochet, and um, this is hand knit and machine knit. And you know, I I love all that sort of thing. At the time, I thought it was really normal, and looking back, it is quite weird. <laughs> but maybe that's just because you're in such like a bubble when you're studying. But. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've, I've since this made like lots of weird objects that kind of look just like this, so I guess it's super inspired by the same thing. And then we had some really funny bags as well I made out of this, like, foam, which you can kind of see. Um, it was meant to be an extension of my wardrobe at the time, but I wasn't wearing anything that weird, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I... It just kind of... It got to the point where it got really, really pushed towards the end, which I think is always the really exciting bit, and when you're making a collection, I find that even now, like, the kind of last week even, or two weeks, you can make like, you can make like 20 looks and they're all really good. But like up until that point, you're kind of mentally really blocked. And um, that's the way I find it anyway. And I think it's the same, even when you're studying, because you get kind of like six months or like, maybe you don't, you get like three months to make a collection of like six looks or something. And you kind of labor over it and, you know, psych yourself out over it. But I think it's kind of sometimes the best bit is when you kind of trust it and go with it at the end. I mean, I love making these. These were the, all the last looks I made. It was very sequential the way I made it. All the first looks were made at the start, and all the later ones were made at the end. Also, when we did the walkthrough, this was at, um, when Fashion Week was at Somerset House, because the St. Martin's MA show was part of Fashion Week. Not everyone's in the show, sadly, but um, so, and the models were falling over in rehearsals, because all the shoes, they're just like heels with these kind of weird spats made out of patent leather and stuff. I mean, really dangerous. I don't know how, again, that really happened. Um, and then these ones. So it's funny for me talking to you guys looking back at this because it's very the first time I've really looked at this stuff in years. So I've, it's quite like interesting for me to see my like growth or like change. Um, but yeah, these are very like unwearable. Speaking of that, pushing that unwearability factor, I think it's really important to kind of obviously think about your market and everything to a degree. But I think you need to kind of just trust yourself and have this kind of central creativity creativity throughout all your work and just push it as far as you can. Um, I feel like now is kids at school like studying that everyone is actually pushing themselves a lot more and I because I teach a bit around and people are getting a lot more like open and getting a bit, lot more creative than when I was at school it was very like people wanted to work for like Celine and everything was very like camel and beige um you know this was very much like people didn't get like I don't know it was just not as open people are a lot more kind of uncommercial now I think at schools which is interesting I think it's really good because you can always draw it back to a commercial side oh, yeah these are the weird little videos I found of them walking in a fitting I don't know why I took these, or I don't even know if I did take them, but you can kind of see them, they kind of bounce a lot, which is quite fun. And these was, this is when it wasn't actually finished, so they're all kind of struggling a bit because they're kind of still pinned. But yeah, you f we fit the day before, I think. So a lot of the jewelry, jewelry was made out of like clay and stuff, so you can kind of see it's pulling them kind of weird directions. Um, it was really fun, actually, to make that collection. <laughs> really well filmed there. Um, yeah, so that was a really good experience. And oh, this is cute. So this is a shoot I did um, directly after the MA, and this is with some of my friends wearing it. I don't. I thought it was cute to put this, put this in here because it looks kind of nice with all the backgrounds and stuff. So I, I didn't. I so I started kind of working at, on like styling things after the MA a tiny bit, but it was never something I'd thought of going into. I didn't really understand what it was as a career styling, but um, since then I 
now technically work at Love Magazine as, as a fashion editor, so, which is great fun, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so after my MA, I got asked to, I, I was asked to be, sh I got shot for Love Magazine. I'm trying to make this understand like sequentially if this is how it happened. And I met Katie Grant, who was the editor of the magazine, very, very briefly on set. And she emailed me in that summer saying, do you want to do some research for Mark Jacobs? And I was like, oh God, yeah, like I've, I'd love to. I didn't really know what it meant or anything, but it eventually turned out to be this print. So I went to Paris and um, for like two days and ended up being like a week. And I got to show Katie and Mark my portfolio. And obviously like, I didn't ever think I'd show someone like that my portfolio. So I was super nervous. Um, and they were like, oh, we like all your drawings and stuff. So maybe you want to work on this print. So this is what this became. And this was, I think summer, oh, I don't even know what year it was, 2014 maybe. Um, so this was, again, like something I'd never really, I'd always drawn a lot at, Scott, at college and at school, but never really thought it was like a career. But I was very lucky to kind of be able to translate this into something completely different. So we can see the, this is, the, this is me taking pictures in the office of the process, which is quite fun. Um, so it's super creative and kind of quite different from what I'd done before. So these are all just me like doing lips and rainbows and they wanted all these kind of really specific shapes in it, which was quite funny. And um, the reason I've kind of got this in here is because since I graduated, I've done kind of a lot of different things that aren't strictly like technically making clothes or like fashion design. So the reason I'm showing you guys this is to show you the kind of the importance of being diverse, I think in like 2018 or even in the future, you know, like trying to like push all your skills equally because you never know where it's going to take you. I think that's really important to be, to be able to have that openness because, you know, even when I finished the MA, everyone was asking me like, what do you want to do? And I just, you know, I said, well, I really want to be creative. I obviously wanted to do my own label, but I did, it wasn't that clear at that time I could do it. So um, I just was kind of really open to all these opportunities and I think that's quite important. So here we have the campaign, which I was very lucky to be in, but I'm not gonna look at that one for too long. Um, <laughs> but um, it was really fun. So when we did the print, obviously they don't tell you if it's gonna be used or anything. I didn't even know till the show had come out if they'd used it. And um, it was in loads of it. And it went into, I mean, like basically every object I had like phone cases was on and stuff, which is very surreal. That's one of those moments that I found very like bizarre. And that doesn't happen that often really. But um, yeah, what a great opportunity to be able to see it from like that early thing being like a kind of drawing on the floor to becoming that, you know, that was a very, and very quick, but very bizarre thing. Cause obviously usually I do everything myself. So for someone else to take it and put it on things was really interesting to see how they did it. So it was super fun. So I'm just gonna have some tea. This is my first shoot for Love Magazine. So I got to, I think I did about, 300 separate drawings for this issue. And um, I got to do them all for the issue. And it, 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 maybe it's like four issues ago, but it's basically throughout the whole magazine. And I was never an illustrator. I was really like, oh, surprised. Um, but this was super fun. So this is kind of my first exposure to kind of being in like a big scale fashion shoot and this kind of, this side of the industry, which is a very different side to actually designing the clothes. You know, you, you see everything in front of you. And I also got to do some of the makeup, which is funny because I'm not a makeup artist. So, um, yeah, it was basically styling my friends and people I work with and everything. So it's really interesting, actually, as well, being on a shoot like this, because you see, like, real clothes, which probably sounds stupid, but when you're in, like, a bubble like me, like, it's very hard to see, like, physical, real stuff. So it's actually a big learning curve for me to see, like, designer things, you know, when you have, like, the big gowns or whatever. It's really interesting to understand it. So I got asked to start doing a lot more illustration work by this point. Um, which you'll see is again throughout this, but it was really fun to do. <clears throat> so this was really funny. This is a perfume company called Miller Harris who asked me to sit in this kind of glass perspex cube in the middle of Covent Garden and draw all over it for three or four days, which was again one of those things I'd never, uh, <laughs> never thought I'd be asked that. And it was really weird because it wasn't actually a pub the public weren't allowed to draw on it, so I just had to sit and do it, and then people weren't allowed to interact, which I thought was really, really strange. Um, but again, just to show you like how the, the skills can kind of be like transferred across like all boards, really, because I'd never done that much illustration until I, did, I started doing that Love Magazine thing, so it was, it was funny, and to draw all over the perfume was funny as well. It kept kind of coming off. We ended up cleaning it off with the alcohol from the perfume, which is probably really unethical. 
really, and that's cool. But um, but this was fun, yeah. I mean, it's very like kitschy and cute, but and again, it was a few years ago. So we go to my uh, this is my next project because I'm showing you everything in like sequential order, so to try and understand like where I got to where I am now. So this was for I got to do the heads for some Mew Mew mannequins at the same time as doing the drawings. Um, so this, I guess this is kind of like visual merchandising in like a really weird twisted way. So I started off doing loads of weird clay things. Um, again, this is kind of probably a year after my MA, so it's kind of very much in that vein of like 3D kind of weird amorphic shapes of like could be an animal but isn't. And the beads again for my BA and all the weird plastic melted stuff. So. The idea was they were doing a presentation in Paris and um, they contacted me and said, we just want something for these heads. It can kind of be as out there as you want. So I'd send them through. I think I had like a week to do this. Usually the timescales for things like this as well are really tight, which is quite scary. I think I had about a week to do this and I was doing it in my garage in New York, like just trying to put things together. And they then decided they wanted more like eyes and lips. So it kind of went full circle in like a few days. So again, this is me like, a lot of my processes are melting stuff. So this is me melting plastic and rubber and to make these kind of like weird eyes and like lips and like crocheted balloon ties or something, you know. I, it's funny looking back at it, but... Um, so then I took everything in these huge suitcases to Paris and then saw these creepy mannequins and got to start putting their faces on. <laughs> um, and they kept... The problem is they did keep falling off because these are like these... They're very shiny. But I just sat in a room for two days in their offices and made more eyes and lips, basically. They had loads of mannequins, actually. Um, but it, it, was, it was fun. But I mean, again, it's kind of this, I guess, like 3D illustration or something, but it was very much like on, on your toes job. You know, you've got to think quickly and be like, okay, how are we going to do faces? Um, but it was fun again. And again, a lot of it was just basically melted plastic into eyes and lips. So we have them here, you see. They're quite scary, but I do quite like them. Um, <laughs> they did kind of peel off a bit. I mean, the earrings are kind of falling off, but... Um, yeah, again, it was another thing that was kind of like on this. It is very related to what I do, but it was just kind of really interesting. And they had uh, this stuff is that we you probably use this if you're into textiles, but it's that kind of like Angelina fiber stuff. You know that stuff? It's kind of like looks like angel hair, and you kind of iron it flat, and it goes really like it's really pretty as you, I mean, you can see. But they loved that. And then Mrs. Prada had to come around and check it, and I didn't realize I had. Well, I didn't leave the room. I just kind of stood there like looking. And um, that was her favourite thing was the fire, but everyone else like left, and I was like, kind of waiting. Um, so it was again a very surreal moment. But uh, yeah, we also did. Ha I did some hats with the melted plastic again. You can see it's my favourite thing at this time, um, and the faces. And we had trays and trays and trays of like eyes and lips made out of clay. I mean, virtually everything you can imagine. Um, so it was really fun. They were kind of like weird brooches. Um, I don't know what happened to all of them actually, but it was a really interesting experience. Um, very like. Vis visual and real, but like life size, and then obviously they were wearing Mew Mew the clothes, so it was, it was nice to see. They kind of look like makeup actually from the distance, and the weird knitted hat thing. Okay, so this was in about like summer of 2016, I think, and then so now we move on to my first show, which was with Fashion East, which I will play now. I'm just going to make sure it's not too loud. Oh, it's quite quiet. <laughs> So this was, um, yeah, so this is kind of, I guess, related to all the projects you've just seen. This is kind of their manifestation in like a fashion form. And it was the first time, I mean, it's a lot more, automatically it's a lot more wearable than like the MA. Because I was kind of doing the things that I was wearing at the time, quite literally. So we did lots of like screen printing with like, just like acetate stencils. Um, all the crystals you see in this video is actually cake trims. Um, sewn together in strips. So it looks like really expensive heavy Swarovski, but it's actually really lightweight plastic trims. Um, yeah, it was super fun. And that was obviously my favorite thing at that point. And it's very much, it was many well, it was very inspired by like Nina Hagen and like that kind of New York 80s vibe, which is something I constantly reference, like Keith Haring. And I was quite direct in what I wanted in this collection. And it was very, I mean, the colors are very acidic. <laughs> It's very bright, but um, it was a really fun process. It was very different because I made this when I moved back to York and made everything in York. So it was very much like uh, kitchen sink quality, like making everything at home in the garage and kind of just working it out that way, opposed to doing it in a big studio with like technicians and stuff. It was 
a lot more kind of real, I thought, and that was what was important to me. Um, my mum helped with the accessories, the earrings, which were great, and they still look amazing, actually. I also worked with Coach for the first time of the season, which is um, the handbag company, so all the bags in the show were customised Coach bags, and you'll see them throughout all the other shows now. Which is funny, but yeah, you see the velour again, in the most tasteful colour. But um, it was fun, because in every other show I did, it was um, student, you know, it was, uh, you can't control the hair and makeup, this is the first show I could control the hair and makeup, and uh, you can tell I went really subtle with it. But yeah, it was it was really fun. It was very kind of innocent in a way, this show, I think. Because it was very like me at that purest form wanting to do this. And this was, so Fashion East, for those of you who don't know, is like a really amazing organization that supports young designers. They do kind of three or four a season, maybe one does a presentation. And you get like a, they help you like financially and they have a space to show. Well, they, they, they show with top shops, they have a top shop space. Um, so this was in Spitalfields Market, and we got we had all the hair and makeup in Wagamama's, which was hilarious and gross. And it was open like 20 minutes after we did it. <laughs> um, it's great for you guys to be able to see it moving as well, because I'm going to show you the still pictures in a minute and kind of talk to the techniques, but it's so much more like a live. Like, and that's why it's nice some of the garments are here from like the other shows, because things look so different on the, in the, on the internet and in the screen, I think, than they do in real life. So yeah, this was all made on like a very like tight budget again. So I just had to be really inventive with the techniques and the processes, which was really fun, really. It looks so good under the lights, actually. It was my challenge to myself to like use as many meters as that cake stuff I could as possible, and that all came from the internet. And it obviously came, and you can see by the size, it came in like this width. I just sewed it on the machine together. So I guess this was like my first like solo show. I mean, it was with two other designers, but it kind of felt like it. And it was like nearly two years, two years ago this September. So again, you can see my use of textiles. It's all screen printed at home. Everything, a lot of things painted with nail varnish, which is something I still love doing. Um, all the cake trim, all the crochet. There was actually no machine knit in this at all, I don't think. It's unusual. And even like all the brooches I made out of this resin, I was doing under my like in my garage, outside my garage. Um, they were like like eggs, glittery eggs. But you always start to realise when you're designing things how small things come across on the body. Like in real life, it can be quite offensive, and then when you see it in photos and everything, it can be completely different. So I usually do fittings on myself or like a fit model and always as I go along take loads and loads of pictures because the, the scaling is really different and you need, I hate this until the end, you can probably tell, it's a running theme. Um, so yeah, so, these, so you can see already it looks very flat in the pictures so that's why the video is so much nicer for you guys to see, it's very much more alive. So yeah, and then obviously this is all the same stuff shredded and, and then crocheted into the skirt. And this was all macrame with this like jersey stuff. So I mean, you know, you can tell how much I, I'm into the textile side of things, even though I, I do think I'm fashion designer. It's very textile based. <coughs> and a lot of, I mean, quite a few of these fabrics came from Leeds Market. I get things from online. I get things from all around. I love going to all the cheap fabric shops because you get the really weird stuff that no one ever really wants to use, I think. And there's always a lot of lycra. And then this is me trying it on as a fitting. Lol. I don't know why this is actually next to that. Anyway, so yeah, so that was that was super fun. And then after this, I worked with House of Voltaire in London, which is um, like a, a gallery that also supports a lot of artists. And I did all these patches, and I, I thought it was quite nice for you guys to see. Like, this is how I drew them. And I sent them to the factory, and then they came back. And they're they're really big. They're like kind of like twenty centimeters big. I also did a zine with them which I don't think is actually in here, which is a shame. But I can show you that in a minute. Um, and I did all these weird objects. It was for like a Christmas thing. It was meant to be like a Christmas wreath made out of clay and a, Christ and a demon face, which is, again, like goes through every level of my work has that face in it pretty much. So this was 
the next issue of Love magazine I worked on, and I think I've worked on three issues of Love now, and um, it's just really different experience than being a designer because you you get to put things together and actually tell a story, even more so in a way, because you're telling it through other people's stuff. So I find it really interesting. And also calling in things, you kind of have to be, you learn like a discipline, have to like work out what you're going to try and say on what person. So it's very different for me, because obviously when I'm designing, you're starting from like complete scratch. So when you're working with a magazine or when you're styling, it's a very different way of storytelling, which is nice. So this was, we worked, I, we always work on the front of BookBit, which is all like different kind of like celebrities or models or actors. It's usually people that are kind of actresses or actors that are starting out in their career. And we kind of go for meetings and we discuss who we want to shoot and everything. So this was great fun. This was directly after, I think. Yeah, so this was the next issue. And then we have Skip about, I think, f five months from the last show we just saw. And then this was my second show with Fashion East. This is Autumn Winter 17. Um, and already you can see it's super different from the one before. It, I think I very much knew I wanted to do something a lot like more muddy <laughs> and more medieval. So it was quite a good, it was like a reaction against the last season, which I think happens with a lot of designers and happens with me a lot of the time. I'm trying to react against what I've just done. Otherwise you're not interested and you're not like keeping yourself engaged in it. So... Yeah, this was, a, I mean, this is, was such a fun show to work on. So you can already, like, see uh, everything was really me meant to be very, like, heavily worn and, like, washed. So you can see here, like, it's all, like, lamb's wool knitted and then kind of, like, just left to fray. It was very much inspired by um, kind of, like, dystopia, sci-fi. I mean, films like Blade Runner that I love, but in kind of a lot more earthy, like, medieval way. So it was meant to be very, like, rootsy <laughs> and almost a bit folky, I think. Um, so kind of compared to the glamorous kind of last show, it was, it was very different, but in my head I felt very over the last show, you know, as soon as you finish, you're kind of on to the next thing. We do have a video of this, actually. Can I, let me just see if I can show it. Um, let's play the video first. So this is the first, um, this is my first and only time I've ever done a set, <laughs> which was really great, but we had, I think, 60 seconds to get it out. I obviously didn't get it out there. I had to have people that helped, and they had to run on with it. But it was meant to be this kind of like, cityscape I wanted the girls to be in and it was obviously all cardboard and sadly we had to destroy it all straight after the show but um, it was nice it kind of helped the narrative of this collection a lot more I think and luckily none of it fell over and this space was amazing this was at, again with fashionese at Tate Modern in like the tanks in big concrete tanks which was very very lucky to have So a lot of, this is a lot of string and a lot of lambs were all knitted together. And everything was really heavily washed and kind of, kind of ruined basically. Again, the makeup was very defiant from the season before. I get to work with Mark Jacobs Beauty, which is amazing. So it was very, very strong this season. Um, I'm also super lucky because I obviously work with Katie Grand and she um, is like a creative consultant with me and she helps and also helps with the casting with Anita Bitten in New York. So I'm very, very lucky for that. We have like, really good girls. So I think this was, for me, was quite a turning point in my head. It was quite a departure aesthetically from what I was doing previously. It's a lot less candy coloured and I've kind of not gone back to the, the candy colours yet. All the badges throughout the collection as well say uh, Bovan Corporation, because it was very much about these like corporations looming down on society. I'm not sure if I, many people actually got that when it happened, but. And on the catwalk, as you can probably see, it's like a huge circle. 
and the girls have to go all the way around and back down and back round. So it, it was the longest count we I've ever done, we ever did, and it, it took a long. It's really nice because you got to see all the clothes a lot more than normal, and that was just the layout really. A lot of the shapes I work with as well when I design are very much squares and rectangles. So this cardigan here was one long rectangle with two rectangle sleeves. And that's something I still do now. It's, I'm very interested in like cutting like that, not cutting traditionally like block based or anything, because that's not what does it for me. Again, I worked with my mum on the jewellery, which was really fun. And it was all meant to be kind of like found objects. There was a lot of like driftwood we painted. This is a big bit of driftwood. It was very much meant to be like pieced together, this collection. So this, that really for me was a big departure from everything beforehand and I was super happy with how it went. So I think since then it's kind of moved on quite a lot, quite quickly. So every season as well I've done, we've done like more looks I think, so I mean I start to lose track. But it's so nice when you see them all together because it's kind of sums up that season. Yeah, so that collection for me felt very much like a departure from everything else before and I was very interested in, like I say, the cutting with squares and not using traditional blocks or traditional shapes at all really and it wasn't feminine in that respect and still much of a clash of textiles obviously as you can see but I was, it was very much more like damaged, <laughs> it's meant to be. And all even like this, all these fabric, this was like nylon like needle punch together. So it was kind of like, kind of shrunk it a bit and gave it this very bizarre texture. And this again was these sort of shapes, the shapes I'm still exploring now, which is very like rectangles pieced together and kind of the arms coming out at different angles and the arm kind of I'm very interested in like working with one piece of fabric and the width of it and where you can cut into it to make shapes for the arms and for the legs. Oh, have we lost it? Okay. This was a film I did for Barbie direct five days after the other show as well, which was um, really amazing because obviously I was, oh, I'm a big fan of Barbie and was growing up as a child. So it was really fun to be able to do this up north and uh, we got to cast all the people from up north. Um, it was great fun, um, very different from making a collection like we just did, but um, this was kind of like my first work in film, but very different from what I've done before. Um, and then we go to spring, summer 18, which 
Yeah, it was last September. So this, you can see this kind of is like a kind of sequel to the Autumn Winter Show. It's like its sister, really. <laughs> um, and it was very much kind of like a gra very much graphic kind of cut up. And everything was actually more shredded and more cut up and more broken than before. Um, I have a few of the pieces from it here. It was kind of meant to be a bit more brutal, like a kind of the apocalyptic desert sister of the other one. So um, <laughs> I was knitting a lot with lycra in the socks and knitting a lot with lamb's wool and boiling it and cotton. <coughs> this was all cotton and wool. And then the digital prints I worked on with my friend, which was really interesting, but meant to be kind of very moving on from the last season. We have a video of this as well, not that one. And all this metallic yarn. I have some of the crochet here, you can see it's, it looks like wire, but actually it's super flexible and super soft. So that became a bit of an obsession of mine. It was it's quite a hard material to work with. So of course I loved it. Um, again, you can see the shapes very much like kind of patched together, kind of squished, very, a bit more brutal than just a jumper. And all this was like hand crocheted and digital print. I'm a big fan of digital print at the minute because it's quite anti the handcraft, which is obviously what else I love doing. So it's quite like juxtaposing, it's quite ugly. This kind of was meant to, all these like weird padding we did was meant to look kind of like the interior of an old spaceship or like ship, kind of waxy, wax fabrics and stuff. kind of had all these weird like lycra crossovers. This actually is also made of lycra and it has like a really weird like texture when, it's, when it pulls on the body. And all these kind of pockets. This was a fun one. Have we got the video for this? Yeah. So this is my last show with Fashion East. So you only get three with women's. And this was meant to be quite ominous. Even though the colours were quite, it was quite a, meant to be quite a disturbing way of showing knitwear, really, I thought.
so this that was last spring summer and with all that kind of knit you see in there kind of all that was all washed again and really really cut up into kind of squares i really wanted it to look like it had been dug up like buried then we dug up so it's kind of all like really like heavily kind of bits coming off it and everything and then we have all the kind of clean weird sporty graphics and logos and prints so it was kind of meant to be sort of mad max like honey honeymoon like hen party in my head anyway so that's why it's kind of has we have these weird like shin pads and these kind of weird board shorts and everything so that was it was really that was a really good one i was happy with that one and then we move on to the last season which this was last this february and this was my first technically standalone show and this was very much inspired by like uh like my grandma and like her matching tweed suits and all that but kind of way much more through a blender so it's kind of all like ravaged and all the bits coming off it and kind of like blown up. And again, we have all the weird squares cut into this, which you'll see. And I'm super happy with this one. I got to work with uh, Coach again and Gina Shoes, who made the really great shoes and the matching tweeds, you'll see kind of throughout. And also loads of other good people. So we have some other stuff from knits and like textiles from this collection here as well. So this was another super fun one. And this was 31 looks, I think. So it was quite a lot. Yeah, so again, lots of like digital print mixed with kind of, we bleached a lot of denim and a lot of the tweeds were kind of hand washed and yeah, it was, I'm really happy with it. You'll see it moving in a minute on the video. All this print was like this mud at the end of my road, which kind of looks weird, like weird camouflage now, but it was, I was kind of happy, happy with that. And then we have these embroideries, which were kind of meant to be like weird crosses, kind of quite an odd, ugly shape and all these prints which we have here as well which were kind of meant to be like quite classic in the colorways but yeah it was kind of quite feminine for me looking back as well i mean you'll see in a minute we had the big skirts but it's really hard when you're making something it's really hard to get perspective on it i only kind of have it now like three months after the show so it's kind of super confusing <laughs> so this is the first time i did like these big shapes and it's quite i guess romantic in that way we have one of the dresses here, but without the skirts, because a lot of it's out on shoots at the minute, sadly, because it gets loaned a lot. And we did the hats for Stephen Jones, which is amazing. I feel very lucky to work with him. All this was computerized knitting again, but like based on like beer mats, uh, beer towels, you know, you get in pubs. And then this one, and we have this dress here, but it looks really different without the, the, the crinoline and the tulle, but it's fun for you guys. To
That will be in July. So yeah, so that was amazing. It was I was actually really unwell <laughs> backstage at the time. I had norovirus, so I was not really there mentally. Um, but it, it was really good still anyway because we did all the work kind of the day before with the fittings and everything. But um, yeah, th that kind of is like in a way full circle, like my work kind of where it's come from and where it's going. So I hope you guys all enjoyed that. And if you can think of any questions, please let me know. Do we have, do, who's got questions? Do we have a microphone? Do we need a microphone? Or do you want to just shout? No, that should be okay. You can just shout at me, it's fine. I've got questions. Yeah, hi. Um, when you, like, finish uni and stuff and you want to go into industry, what would you say was, like, the most important things that people look at? Or, like, when you are hiring someone, what are you looking for, whether it's, like, portfolio, or brain, or, like, in, like being in digital, what are you looking for? I guess, for me personally, I guess, I guess the first thing you see is portfolio. And that kind of is like a representation of like you as a person and should be like you as your work and a person <clears throat> and that kind of how that gels together. But I mean, it depends what sort of part of the industry you want to go into. But I guess it, I, any way it should reflect where you want to go. And then also when you meet people face to face, I feel like that kind of is like 50 percent of it because, you know, you have to know if you're going to get on with someone or how it's going to work. Um, it's a big part of it is how you come across as a person as well with the work and if you can back it up and if you really believe in it I think that's really important 
Does that answer that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what was the, uh, in terms of the kind of aesthetic choices between the sort of music that you use to, to represent each like, look, did, did, you, uh, did you choose each of those pieces of music because of their kind of, did they hold like a particular similarity aesthetically to the kind of the idea that you were, that was kind of central to how the, how the, how the looks were, were, con were constructed? Mm -hmm. Is there like quite a strong Yeah, I, it's usually like emotional, so I kind of want to, I'll kind of send it to someone who helps mix the music at the end, uh, quite near the end, uh -huh. and um I kind of usually want something that's... Because obviously in that space, you need to have some sort of energy from the music, otherwise it kind of falls a bit flat. So that's usually quite important. But then again, this season especially, I kind of wanted it to kind of be a bit more jarring, you know, kind of not mix as well and not be too expected, really, I think. But it's usually just, like, it depends on the emotion of what you want to con con show. <laughs> Does that answer that? Yeah? Mm -hmm. sort of coming up north like what what would you like advice would you give to like students up north who maybe like don't have like the city connections yeah like london provides i think well i mean i think it's good really good these days with the internet because i feel like now there is slightly more well there is more of a voice for people outside london i think people are actually looking more outside london because it's getting more it's way more interesting and also people are a bit bored of london you know a lot of my friends actually no one i really know not that many of them live there now because they can't afford it, you know, it's, it is really expensive. And there is like the difference between actually having the time and the means to make your own work, whether that be fashion or art or anything, you know, you need to kind of have, you can't, I mean, a lot of people I know in London do work like kind of five or six days a week solidly and don't really have the time to make anything. So it's kind of like depends what you want to do, but I feel like people are definitely looking more towards out of London. And I think there is ways of sharing it. I think it's getting more exciting. Personally, that's a question. Yeah. Do you sketch your collection uh, yeah. before you start, or do you just work freehand on the staff? Um, sketch everything. Yeah. Right. I should have put some of those in. Actually, sorry, I don't know why I didn't. I haven't. We haven't like the, the wall full of them. Um, obviously, it changes quite a lot, but it's good for me to kind of work it out. And then a lot of it is draped as well. But this season, especially, actually, I drew a lot beforehand because it kind of I wanted to understand this, like where it was going story-wise. I guess storyboarding it maybe. Questions? There was one over here. Yeah. Is there, is, have you seen any of your kind of influences trickle down through the high street? You know, the way it works in kind of high fashion? Um, no, but I wouldn't say I necessarily look at high street that much. But um, no, I haven't. But I, I don't know if it has or it hasn't. Maybe it's too weird. Um, maybe I mean, I'm sure aspects of it will, yeah, of course, because it does. But I guess it wouldn't really bother me. It's the way it always is. But yeah. it'd be quite funny, I guess. I suppose it probably has had an influence. Probably by it. <laughs> yeah, um, but not yet, no. Questions? Yeah. If you were to ask a person off the train, yeah. how would you say to get yourself like noticed by like, an employee? Would you say it's a game portfolio or like, cover letters and stuff like that? I would say portfolio, definitely. Um, c because obviously people see a lot of them, so I feel like trying to make it as yourself as you can um, is kind of important. And also, when you you know go for an interview, it's kind of it's kind of important to kind of make an impression, but not like in a loud way, but just kind of being able to kind of have like the conviction and be able to like believe in it completely. Yeah. Can I ask about um, process in terms of collaboration and how much you work with the people, or is it very much kind of a solitary act? Because you said you mentioned uh, your garage, and that's yeah. the main work. Um, I think you should want to be able to commit 100% to it if you're doing something like I think you kind of have to um, and that's kind of goes without saying but I do have people I work with um, and kind of looking at outsourcing as well in the future but I'm just kind of being a bit control freaky about it and making sure it's what I want because it's very difficult to kind of translate that sort of thing into kind of a commercial venture but it's something I'm looking into. Yeah, it, I guess, no, it's it's quite fun. I mean, it is, all the people come right at the end for the show. That's when you have, like, 
a lot of people and it's quite stressful. But it's, it's always really good fun. It's like going from being like kind of a, a really small team to being a massive team right at the end. So it's quite surreal, really. It's an odd process, but it's good. Questions? Yes? When you go into production with the collection mm -hmm. you've got orders, is this quite an unconventional approach to constructing clothes? Mm -hmm. Is this like the bit of flat pattern cutting starting to happen in the last collection? Mm -hmm. And how did such kind of creative pieces do manage to grade up or down into sizes? Or it's all one size at the minute, so tends to be, yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially some of it's like the square stuff's a bit more like not like it's more generously cut, so it kind of can fit a few different sizes. Um but yeah, that's what, what sort of um, shops are you selling through? I sell with matches at the minute. Just matches exclusively. But yeah. Yeah. No. No, um, I've always seen it as being completely unisex. But do you have to just categorise it to be unisex? No, it's just the first show I had all girls and it kind of, I was quite happy with it because I think most people that kind of know me kind of know it is kind of unisex. And I do have quite a lot of um, sort of men that, or younger men that buy it and like message me and like pictures and stuff of them in it, which, you know, like people like love wearing it, I think. I think it doesn't really matter what, gender they are. Yeah. Who would you say has been your biggest influence? Influence? Um, I think when I was growing up, I really liked Westwood, of course. I'm a huge fan of her and Andreas. Um, but it, it can be a lot of people. I guess growing up, I looked at a lot of designers. It doesn't, I'm, I'm, it doesn't have to be a designer either. I'm just thinking. Just yeah. Thinking. I find it quite difficult to pinpoint things like that. It, de it depends, really, on what element. But, um, no, I'd say, well, I mean, yeah, I would say Westwood's a big influence. Are you ever influenced by something that's, like, not from human beings? There's, like, <laughs> well, like aliens. an insect called a caddisfly that constructs, like, a, a shell out of, like, uh, discarded uh, pieces of material that it finds in riverbeds that look really similar to the kind of compositional... Style of some of the yeah. I actually, yeah, I know. I think I know what you're talking about. That's that's a nice reference. Yeah. But um, I tend to not reference things directly. But it's kind of I see it as like a melting pot. Although I think maybe as I go on, I'll have to start separating things to make it make more sense. But um, oh no, it comes from all over. It's de I don't really ever look at fashion for inspir in inspiration in that way at all. Um, I do look at bits of it, but I'm more interested in kind of the like a certain color or a certain texture or a certain process because it is called very much like that is in the, in the heart of all this really and kind of me just pushing myself and my taste levels really i think any more questions yeah <laughs> i think the only advice I can give about a mental blog is if you keep working, it's the best thing to do is to not procrastinate. I think the more you work, the better. But like, you know, like, like working it out literally, I think. I tend to, like I said, towards the end of a collection, I have like a million more ideas and it makes much more sense by that point. But if you kind of, at the start is the hardest bit when you're kind of trying to understand where you're going with it. But it's very easy to put things off. But obviously I have, do have deadlines and they come on really quickly. So I start as early as I can really. Any more questions? Yeah. Well, how are you managing your personality to be at such a point where your designs are almost like <coughs> your own and you're sort of always having your own reflection? Mm -hmm. Are you at that point yet? Is it I'm looking into it, so yeah, kind of technically, but everything's in house at the minute, which is, mm -hmm. which is nice, but I need to, that's what I mean, I'm kind of being control freaky about it. I don't want to, something subpar, you know. It's kind of tricky. I'm looking at like factories up north as well and trying to work out if that could be a possibility, because obviously, I technically am based up here, so it kind of is a lot more complicated to do it in London, even though I go down a lot. Like, it's going to be kind of hard to keep an eye on it. So, yeah, kind of looking into that at the minute. It's exciting. It's just everything comes around so quickly. You know, like, it's going to be September before I know. Oh, yeah, September. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, my mind's kind of blurred at the minute. <laughs> Any more questions?
Yeah. Don't forget that Matthew did invite you to come down and have a look at some of the outfits closer if you want at the end. But thank you so much, Matthew Boban. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.